pause, maybe Dr. Fabian Bob, and we'll get to your questions. All right. Thank you guys very much for coming out this afternoon. It's a beautiful day, huh? I guess no one here is going to the Royals game tonight. <laughs> but you'll be home in time to see it. So currently I'm an assistant professor at Kansas State University. I'm a veterinary oncologist. And I thought I would, oops, now the clicker's not working. It was working a second ago. Well, I will click it. We'll just go and click. Mm, about, Does the arrow work? Sometimes if you just, oh, there it is. just hit the How arrow. Okay. So I am actually from northwest Missouri. I'm from Maryville, Missouri, so I'm not far from home here. Um, I grew up in northwest Missouri, and I actually received an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree from northwest Missouri State. My father was a chemistry teacher, and if you think that having your parent, I don't know, how many of you guys have ever had your parent in as a teacher? Has that happened to you? I had my father as a chemistry professor in my freshman year in college. That was a little bit intimidating. <laughs> but anyway, I come from Northwest. I have a bachelor's degree in pre-professional zoology. So I went to college thinking that I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, I think I decided at about the age of seven that that's what I wanted to do with my life. How many of you guys had think that becoming a veterinarian is what you want to do? I figured probably all of you, but most of you. Um, it is certainly a very d diverse career. So after I graduated from Northwest, I actually went to the Uver University of Missouri, which is where I received my veterinary medical degree. And then after, so I had four years at Northwest, four years at the University of Missouri for my DVM. And then after that, I actually decided at that point that I wanted to specialize. So I moved to Rochester, New York. And if you think it snows a lot here, moved to Rochester, New York, where they have lake effect snow. I learned what lake effect snow was very quickly in the year. Um, two feet of snow is a lot of snow in 12 hours. But I moved to Rochester for a year and did an internship in a small animal specialty clinic, so in a private practice in Rochester. And then after that, I decided that I wanted to do an oncology residency. And so I actually moved back to the University of Missouri and did three more years of residency work and I also received a master's degree um, during my residency so did some research as well as a clinical degree. So all in all after high school I spent 12 more years um, in college. So four years at Northwest, four years in veterinary school and then four years specializing. So um, a lot of time there but I have some very very fond memories and don't regret doing it at all. So. So after I finished my residency at Missouri, I actually moved to Kansas City, and I was an oncologist at Mission MedVet for a year and a half, and then I decided I wanted to get back into academia and do some teaching. So at that point, I moved to Auburn, Alabama. So I lived there for three and a half years, and then I decided it was time to come home. My parents lived in Northwest Missouri, so I wanted to come home. So in 2007, I started working at K-State, and that's where I have been ever since. I don't know, have you guys ever been to the, the campus at K-State, the veterinary school? So these pictures will look familiar to you. This is actually Mosier Hall. This is where the veterinary hospital is. So this is where my office is in this building. So the veterinary hospital is in here and also the diagnostic lab. So if a veterinarian that you work for, if they take a biopsy of something and send it to the pathologist, they send it to the diagnostic lab that's also in Moser Hall. So it's really nice because we're right there together. So I can go upstairs and talk to the pathologist if I have a question about a sample that I submitted. So it's nice that we're all there together. And then on the other side of Moser Hall, over here, the next building over is called Trotter Hall. And that's actually the academic building where all of the classes are taught to the first through third year students. Most of the classes for the third year students. Some of those classes are actually taught in Moser Hall. So. There's another building on the other side of Trotter Hall. So Trotter is right here. This little walkway above ground connects Mosier and Trotter Hall. There's another building called Coles Hall, which is where a lot of research is done. So a lot of basic scientists and, and animal research is, is done there. So lots of questions being answered. 
And you guys all recognize Willie the Wildcat. They have a, a promotional going on right now where they're, they're taking pictures of our pets with Willie and, and someone wins every um, week and gets to be on the, the Jumbotron at the football games with Willie. So these were a couple pets of the week and they, they belong to one of the veterinarians, one of the equine veterinarians at the vet school. So our pets, as I'm sure you guys can agree, our pets are all family. So they're part of the big picture. <laughs> so how many of you guys knew today, before you came today, that oncology was the study of cancer? Were you all familiar with that? So we study, as an oncologist, I'm a medical oncologist, so most of my job is involved in the diagnosis and treatment of cancers in pets, dogs and cats. How many of you guys knew that dogs and cats developed cancer? Good, so it's not a surprise to you. Um, it's actually pretty common. So most of my work is in the diagnosis and treatment, especially when I'm in the clinic and practicing veterinary medicine. But we also look into the causes of cancer and how the cancers develop. Because as we develop new treatments, we want to either prevent it from occurring or by understanding how it develops, we can actually maybe prevent that stage of development from happening so we can prevent the cancer from developing. Or what we may do is design a treatment that if this was the cause of the cancer, we may be able to turn that switch off so we can turn those cancer cells off to some degree. And you might also add, how come I keep having pictures of crabs up there? And every specialty, cardiologists, they can have pictures of hearts, and ophthalmologists, they can have pictures of eyeballs. Oncologists can't really have pictures of tumors, so we have to pick something cute to represent our specialty, right? So the zodiac sign for, for cancer is the crab, so we tend to have lots of crabs around, and, and that's why. It's not because we're crabby people most of the time. <laughs> So I thought one question might be that you would have is why on earth would you choose cancer or oncology as a specialty? It seems like such a depressing science. And sometimes it is because many, some of these diseases are life-limiting diseases, not all of them. A lot of these diseases we can cure with therapy, but there are a fair number of these that, that can be life-limiting. Um, but when I was on the path to deciding what I wanted to do, um, with veterinary medicine, my initial interests were either as a pathologist or as an internal medicine specialist. I wanted to go into diagnostic medicine of some part. Of some part. Um, I wasn't interested in surgery. I, I actually haven't handled a scalpel blade for I don't know how long, so I try to stay away from surgery. That's not an interest of mine. I was just too anxious when those pets were underneath anesthesia and it was up to me to make them come out alive. It was very stressful. So I knew I wanted to go into diagnostic medicine. And one of my very first intern or mentors during my internship in upstate New York when we were getting lots of snow was an oncologist. And he kind of took me under his wing and I realized, you know, oncology and pathology kind of go together. Because we do a lot of pathology, obviously, to get a diagnosis. And so they come together. And so for me, it was a perfect fit of my interests. And it also, one of my very favorite parts of my job is working with the pet owners. So you guys know that pets are our family, and pet owners, especially of oncology patients, are the most dedicated owners that there are. So for me, it's very rewarding to work with these clients on a day-in and day-out basis. On an average, I probably see some of my clients, I may see them 50 times. Many specialists will only see the clients once or twice. Whereas we will see these pets over and over and over again. And so we develop a really strong relationship. So for me, it's really rewarding in, in developing a bond with the patients as well as their owners and working with them over a period of time and not just a short period of time. So for me, oncology is actually a very people-oriented um, profession. I will tell you, if you don't want to work with people, don't go into clinical medicine because Every pet that you see as a veterinarian has an owner that goes with it. So we work with patients or with, with people every single day. It is definitely a people profession as a clinical veterinarian. So the other thing that really intrigued me with oncology is that it is a rapidly changing field. Things that we know today, we're developing new methods, new techni techniques. We're understanding more about tumors. Just in the last three or four years, there have been 
at least three um, FDA or USDA approved veterinary products. And there's three or four more that are coming out for specific use in dogs or cats for treatment of cancer. Before that, there were zero. So the fact that we've had multiple in the last couple of years is pretty impressive. So things are changing every single day in our profession. And the other thing that really interested me as a resident when I was studying oncology that I never really thought about, but when we treat cancer in pets, they are translatable. That cancer is translatable to disease in people. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in people is very similar to lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's-like lymphoma in dogs. So we can actually do clinical trials in our patients that actually may then become a treatment for lymphoma in people. There are a number of, of therapies. One therapy um, for melanomas. Dogs get melanomas. They tend to happen in the mouth and not on the skin. But there is an immunotherapy, a, a treatment vaccine that stimulates the immune system that has been in clinical trial development in dogs that now is in clinical trial in people because of the evidence for, for efficacy that we found in dogs now as treatment in people. So um, not only are we helping pets and we're helping their owners, but we are potentially helping humans with cancer as well. And the NIH and the National Cancer Institute of the NIH have recognized the benefit of dogs um, as a translatable, not just dogs, but cats as a translatable research model to, um, to tumors in people. And so while we're helping those pets, we're helping people. So you might ask, I, I don't really have to tell you this, but these are some fun facts that I actually like to, to show about how strong the human-animal bond is. It's pretty impressive. These statistics actually were derived almost 10 years ago now from the American Animal Hospital Association. They haven't done the same study again, so I've um, had to use, keep these same statistics. But 63% of people back in 2004 owned a pet. Americans owned a pet, which almost two-thirds of Americans. That's pretty impressive. Um, more people at that point in time had pets than actually had children. 70% of pet owners think of their pets as their children. I actually had pets before children, so I, I can see both sides of the fence for sure. 83% um, of us refer to ourselves as our pet's mom or dad. I know I do that. 60% almost celebrate birthdays. Almost 80% of us give our pets gifts at holiday time. 62% um, of us include our pets in our holiday cards. We just had our holiday photos taken, our Christmas card pictures taken. Our pets were right there. Actually, our cat climbed up in the tree to have its picture taken with us. We didn't encourage that, but he did it on his own. Um, and then 63% of pet owners tell their pet that they love them at least once a day. So I know I do that to my pets before we go to bed every night. 80% of people acquired their pet for companionship. So there are a fair number of pets that are also working animals, but many, most of us acquired them for companionship. This is my favorite statistic, that 57% of pet owners that were surveyed said they wanted their pet to be their only companion if they were stranded on a deserted island. That's pretty impressive, huh? 90% <laughs> of pet owners said they wouldn't date someone if they weren't fond of their pet. I know I've been there. 36% of pet owners have named a guardian for their pet. 20% include their pet in a will. Now, whether or not that stands up in a court of law, that has yet to be shown, but almost 50% of pets sleep in their owner's bed. And 76% of us feel guilty when we leave our pets home alone. So the human-animal bond is pretty strong. And one question that always comes up, do people really spend money on their pets for treating cancer? And the answer is, Yes, with this strength of a bond, pets are family for many people. Some people can't, and that's perfectly fine, um, but people will if they can. So when we think about how often does cancer occur, it happens pretty frequently. It is the number one cause of death in pets that are older than the age of two. Before two, they're wild and crazy, and we have trauma and hit by cars and potentially congenital things that happen that, that pets die from. But in adult pets, um, it is, or at least dogs, it is the leading cause of death. Dogs don't get um, the cardiac disease that, that people, the atherosclerosis that we tend to get. So heart disease is the leading cause of death in people, but um, cancer is close behind. Um, when we think about how many dogs die from cancer, one in four overall 
when you're considering all ages of dogs. It is the leading cause of disease-related death. So another study showed that 47% of dogs die from cancer and about a third of cats will die from cancer. So this picture, actually I found it on the internet, but I loved it because we see all the pictures of the kids that are finishing up their chemotherapy and the adults. And that is fantastic. This to me, again, shows the human-animal bond where they also have the picture of their dog who just received her last chemotherapy treatment. So. So one question you might ask is, if cancer is so common, then what are things we can look for that might be a signal that, that cancer is there? And sometimes there are no warning signs, but we tend to think about 10 potential signs, try to distill it down into 10 things that we can look for that might be a signal that there could be something wrong that could be associated with a cancer. The first on the list is a lump or bump that grows or changes. So there are a lot of lumps that happen on dogs that are benign, but if you have a lump on your dog or your cat that you notice that increases in size or it changes in consistency, it's probably something worth checking out. Dogs especially get fatty tumors. I have a, a Labrador retriever who's 12 years old and she's covered in fatty tumors, but they haven't changed in size really. So I just keep an eye on them. If they get bigger, then I'll take them in and, and I'll aspirate them to see what kind of cells are there again. <clears throat> but we want to make sure that we check out lumps or bumps that are growing or changing. A wound that doesn't heal. Some people describe cancer actually as a wound that will not heal. Um, and so if we have a, a picture of a cat, if we think of a cat with a scratch on his nose, cats get squamous cell carcinoma that's solar induced. And so um, a bump or a, a scratch on its nose that just doesn't heal can actually be an early stage skin cancer in the cat. That can happen in the skin of dogs also. A lameness that is persistent or recurrent. Dogs can become lame for a lot of reasons. So just because your dog becomes lame doesn't mean it has a cancer. But if it's persistent, it doesn't improve when you give them anti-inflammatory medications or, or whatnot, um, then that's something that probably needs to be checked out. Unexplained weight loss. An animal that's eating a normal amount and losing weight, that's a sign that there's something going on. Many times they don't just have weight loss and have a normal appetite if it's cancer causing the weight loss. Many times they will actually have a decreased appetite or inappetence um, to go along with that weight loss. But sometimes you just have um, weight loss. Difficulty eating or swallowing is another symptom. Per perhaps there is something in the mouth that's preventing them either from picking up food or from being able to swallow the food. Bleeding from a body opening, so from the mouth, from the ears, from the digits, it's not really an opening, but we can see tumors of the nail bed, so bleeding from the, the toes, um, or actually bleeding from the rectum is also another symptom potentially of cancer. An offensive owner, odor, excuse me, not owner, um, an offensive odor, particularly from the mouth, um, dogs or cats with oral tumors, they tend to bleed, and so you may not see the blood because they may swallow it, but that dried blood smell can be really offensive and so offensive oral odors in particular are what I think about, or ears, sometimes they can get dry, crusty blood in the ears. Um, there's a tumor down there. Leth or difficulty breathing or going to the bathroom. So if there's a mass in the lungs, that's gonna make it dif more difficult to breathe if that mass is really large. Um, but also going to the bathroom. If there's a mass in the rectum, that can make it challenging to defecate. Or a mass in the bladder, that can make it challenging to urinate. They can't tell us when it's uncomfortable. We have to wait and, and see and to see that they're actually having problems. So, and then lethargy or loss of stamina is another symptom we, we often think about. So here's some pictures of symptoms of warning signs of cancer. I tried to put them all on one slide so I didn't have a million slides to go through. Um, so they're kind of crammed here, but here's a kitty. I mentioned this is a cat that actually had a, has a squamous cell carcinoma on its nose. And you can see that that just looks like it's a, a wound that, that has gotten bigger and bigger. And it did just start out as a small little scab um, on the tip of its nose. Cats that have solar-induced or sun-associated squamous cell carcinomas, it tends to happen on the non-pigmented skin. So the white parts, the parts that have white hair, um, so that their nose, around their eyes, on the tips of their ears, 
We don't see a whole lot of it here in the upper Midwest because our animals aren't outside near as much. But when I practiced in Alabama, we saw it very frequently because many of those pets, cats are outdoor animals and they're always sunbathing. And so we saw it a lot more then. I actually practiced in Alabama um, when Katrina hit. And we had a lot of, of people relocate to our area that were from the, the Louisiana area. And it was actually even more prevalent in those populations. That's when we saw, I saw the most, is when those people all moved up to, to the Alabama area. Here's a picture of a dog who's lethargic. He's not feeling well. He actually had a tumor associated with his knee. He had a plasma cell tumor associated with his knee, and so it really hurt him to walk. So while he may not necessarily be lethargic because he has system-wide disease, he hurt so much that he didn't want to get up and walk and he just was really lethargic and quiet all of the time. Here's a dog, and it's hard to see actually in the light. Can we turn the light down at all? This dog will, has actually blood coming from its nose. We call that epistaxis when we have bleeding from the nostril. It's, yeah. And when we see bleeding from the nose, a sign that it's cancer associated, more often it's unilateral, it's only one nostril that we see blood from because we can see tumors inside the nasal cavity. I'll show you a picture of one here in a little bit. Um, but we can see um, nasal tumors that can cause erosion of the, all of the tissue inside the nose and so we can see nosebleeds. If we have a systemic kind of cancer or an infectious process, we more often see bilateral, so blood from both nostrils, bilateral epistaxis. Um, and so this dog, it was only one side of, of the, the nose, one nostril. And you'll also notice if you look at his eyes, his third eyelid is up. His tumor actually was eroding through his, his, the bone on the side of his nose and it was up underneath his eye, so it was kind of pushing his eye forward. When you compare it to the other side, it's covered in hair, but you can see how it's kind of in a normal position there. Um, so we saw some facial deformity also that might not necessarily be noticeable until you really start to scrutinize one side from the other. And that's what we do a lot with, with cancers and when we're trying to diagnose abnormalities or a problem, trying to figure out what's causing the problem. With nasal bleeding or epistaxis, we do look at for symmetry on one side of the face to the other and see if there's any evidence of a space occupying mass that would suggest that maybe there's a tumor there. Sometimes we can have fungal infections though that can do the exact same thing a tumor does. It can grow that the, the immune system can lay down tissue. Um, we call it granulomatous disease where they're laying down kind of scar tissue um, and it looks like a tumor but it's actually a fungal infection that we need to go in and treat um, when it's in the nasal cavity. Here's a cat that has a squamous cell carcinoma in its mouth. This is a cat that presented to its primary veterinarian for halitosis, for stinky breath. And when they got to looking in his mouth, he had erosion on that whole side of his mouth, his maxilla there on the right side um, with a tumor. We see a fair number of squamous cell carcinomas in, oral cat, or in older cats. Exactly why, we don't know. Might be associated with secondhand smoke is one theory. Um, but we do see a fair amount of, of squamous cell carcinomas in cats. Here's a picture of a dog. Um, this dog's name was Cheyenne. She was one of my favorite patients. But she presented to us, and if you can see, this is actually a mass associated. It's right inside her rectum. It's associated with her anal sac. Dogs have sacs right on the, um, kind of at the 7 o'clock, the 4 o'clock and the 7 o'clock position associated around their anus. And they help um, kind of the pheromones and, and scent. If you ever have smelled a dog who's expressed his anal sac, so that really stinky smell that happens, there's a gland associated with that sac that's an apricot gland. And we, they're called apricot gland adenocarcinomas. And it's a pretty common tumor that we see in dogs. As an oncologist, it's one that I frequently see. Um, and this one had grown quite large, was that whole right side of her perirectal region. So she was actually having trouble defecating. When she came to us, that's what the owners noticed, is that it was taking her a lot longer to poop, and her, her uh, feces was just long ribbon-like feces because it had to come around that mass, and so it was just being flattened out as she went to the bathroom. This is a picture of a dog that actually had a tumor in the back of his tongue. 
Um, this dog's name was Burley, and it was kind of a black dog, and it was right at the very base of, of her, actually, tongue. So it was not one that we could easily remove because you can't take all of the tongue out. There's only a certain amount you can take out, and the rest you can't get to. Dogs can do without the, the free part of their tongue, but that immovable part of the tongue we can't take out. So we were able to go in there and kind of scoop it out a little bit, and we figured out that it was a melanoma. And so we treated Burley with the melanoma vaccine that I mentioned, and we also treated her with chemotherapy, and she did fantastic. Most dogs with oral melanomas don't live longer than six to eight months, some of them 12 months, but Burley lived three years. So she did fantastically well. But she presented because of a stinky mouth, because and also problems getting food in. She was losing weight because she wasn't eating as much, and then she had really bad breath. But this mass was so far back on her tongue, you couldn't see it when you just opened her mouth. You had to really open her mouth and pull out her tongue so you could see all the way back there. So it wasn't anything that her owners could see at home. Here is a picture of a kitty that's lost a lot of weight and is unkept. She actually, to be honest with you, she just had a bath, so she really looks bad. Um, but she was really, really thin. And this is a cat that we were treating for lymphoma associated with her intestinal tract. It's a pretty common disease that we see, or a pretty common cancer in, in older cats that we see that's very treatable with chemotherapy. Um, but weight loss and diarrhea and, and inappetence are pretty common findings that we see with GI lymphoma in cats. And then here's a picture of a dog that had a mass on his foot that wasn't there um, a month or so before, and it turned out to be a mast cell tumor there on the top of his foot. So th these are all symptoms of things that we look for of pets that present to us potentially with cancer. So then you might ask, well, what are causes of cancer? And there are many potential causes of cancer. And I'm not going to go into the, the whole physiology of cancer by any means, because that's way beyond me, quite frankly. Um, but when I think about cancer and the causes of cancer, the first thing to remember is that cancer is a genetic disease. It is changes in the DNA and expression of the DNA that causes a normal cell to become a tumor cell. Here's a normal cell. Some sort of event has affected that cell, potentially a carcinogen, or maybe it was a mutation that occurred in the DNA before you were ever born. It was something that you inherited from a parent, potentially. Um, and then more mutations occur that then lead to a population of tumor cells. So most cancer cells will have at least four to six mutations in the DNA before they are actually a, an invasive form of cancer. And there are many things that can affect cells to cause changes in, in the DNA or mutations in the DNA from viruses to chemicals to physical factors such as sunlight. Um, even hormones are associated with the development of cancer. So when I think about causes of cancer in pets, viruses, they integrate into the DNA and they change the expression. They may turn a cell on so it's constantly dividing, whereas there's normal mechanisms by which that cell would be turned off and would stop dividing. The virus has inserted itself into that DNA so those cells continually divide and they keep populating. And that's the mechanism by which um, like feline leukemia virus. How many of you guys have heard of feline leukemia virus? That's the mechanism by which the feline leukemia virus is, is problematic. Um, so papillomas also are caused by, well, we, we don't really think of them as being a malignant form of cancer. They are an abnormal growth, and so they are associated with the virus. And then I mentioned the, the feline leukemia viruses that, that predisposes to leukemia and lymphoma. This is actually a kitty named Samba that we treated for feline leukemia virus associated lymphoma. And many people think that if a cat has Feluc, then it's not going to live very long. This cat was infected as a young cat with Feluc, and he lived for, gosh, five years, I believe, with lymphoma. So he was treated initially, he went into complete remission. And then two or three years later, he came out of remission and we treated him again and he lived for another couple of years. So just because they're infected with the virus doesn't mean they can't respond and, they, and they're not, we shouldn't treat them because some of them will do really, really well. 
chemical factors that can be associated with cancer development, secondhand smoke I, I mentioned. So we all think of lung cancer with secondhand smoke or firsthand smoke. We think of that in people, smokers, and the risk of developing lung cancer. But there's actually been a study that showed that cats that lived in households with smoking, they were significantly more likely to develop lymphoma than cats that, that didn't. And some of the cats in the study also um, developed oral squamous cell carcinoma. So you might ask, how on earth does that happen? And when you think about the secondhand smoke that's in the air, it's gonna land on the pet's coat being in the environment. And what do cats like to do? They constantly clean themselves, don't they? And it's their tongue that's gonna be associated or pick up the, the um, carcinogens or in the smoke that's on their coat. So um, it was a weak association, but there was only about a 30% response rate to the study. So um, we are concerned about the risk of secondhand smoke and the development of squamous cell carcinomas in cats. And this is a picture, this is where they usually occur, right underneath the tongue, at the base of the tongue. So again, it's not something we can remove because cats don't do very well if they don't have their tongue. So. Okay, so chemical factors. Another concern is pesticides, herbicides, insecticides. Um, the herbicide 2,4-D has been associated with the development of urinary bladder cancer um, in dogs, particularly um, in the Schnauzer breed of dogs. And lymphoma also is a concern with chronic high exposure to um, lawn chemicals. So um, we try to, to limit the exposure. I try to limit the exposure that my pets have to lawn chemicals for sure. My husband isn't very happy with me about that. but <laughs> um, And it, it makes sense to me because if we're killing an insect or for preventing weeds from growing, then it makes sense that it could potentially cause mutations in the DNA. What exactly happens, we don't know, but there just has been associations with the development of cancers in pets. And then I mentioned sunlight, squamous cell carcinomas, just like skin cancer in people. That's usually, um, or it can be a squamous cell carcinoma. It can also be melanoma in people. Um, tronic, trauma or chronic inflammation has been associated with cancer development in cats. The one thing that comes to mind most frequently are the injection site sarcomas, where cats that get vaccines or injections underneath their skin, there is a risk of developing a tumor or a sarcoma at the injection site. It's about one in 10,000 vaccinates that will develop a sarcoma. So it's not all that common, but um, these are really aggressive tumors and really difficult to treat. Um, so it, it does present a problem for some owners. Some owners wanna not vaccinate their pets at all, which I can understand that perspective. But the one thing we have to remember is, is we're vaccinating for diseases that potentially are zoonotic. And the most important one is rabies. Rabies is a fatal zoonotic disease. And when I mean zoonotic, it's transmittable from pet to human. It's something that humans can catch, one species to another. And so just not vaccinating cats is not an option because we have, a, as veterinarians, we have a responsibility to protect the public also. So it, it can be um, challenging to when we're talking with owners that say I don't want to vaccinate my pet because I've heard about these sarcomas or I had another cat that had a sarcoma I don't want to risk it um, we do definitely have to counsel our, our clients on when we should vaccinate and when we shouldn't vaccinate um, and there are studies that are looking at how often do we really need to vaccinate our pets our cats for these diseases so we can minimize the potential risk for tumor development So you mean like where insulin is injected? So that's a good question. The question is, have we looked at other things besides just vaccines and the risk? And there have not been any reports of, of tumors being associated with insulin injection. Um, but there have been reports associated with the microchips. You know, we think about at putting microchips underneath their skin so if they're lost, we can find them. There have been reports of, of sarcomas associated with those in cats. There was one report in a dog, but it's been refuted by several people. So um, cats are great at forming scar tissue. If they get a foreign body in them, they wanna wall it off. That's what their body wants to do. 
And so they want to heal. And so that's why we think these happen is because cats are just so impressed, such impressive healers, basically, um, that they form a tumor that, that those healing cells develop mutations and tumors develop at that site. So, so the other thing that we've heard of, just like asbestos, can cause cancer in people. You've all heard those commercials about mesotheliomas and asbestos exposure. They can cause mesotheliomas in dogs and cats also. So it's not just a human problem, it's a dog and cat, a pet problem too. And then I mentioned hormonal factors earlier. Um, we've all, you're, if you've talked to your veterinarian about your young pet, your young dog or your cat, when should we spay or neuter them? One of the reasons for spaying and neutering them before they ever go into heat is because we decrease, almost make the risk of them developing mammary cancer, we make it almost zero. So if those mammary, that mammary tissue has never been exposed to any hormones, then the risk of developing a tumor is less than 0.01% when you compare it to a normal intact dog. And so it definitely decreases the risk of breast cancer in dogs. And dogs, unlike people, dogs have 10 mammary glands. So there's a lot of tissue there um, that potentially is at risk. We also know in cats that it does appear to decrease the risk of mammary tumor development in cats. Having said that, there are now studies that are coming out that are actually showing some protective benefits from the development of other tumor types in animals that are not spayed or neutered at a young age. One example is osteosarcoma, which is a bone tumor that we see in a lot of giant, big breed dogs. They've looked at Rottweilers, and they appear to have a decreased risk if we don't spay or sexually alter them until after a year of age. And so there is some information that's coming out that maybe we need to wait a little bit longer. Maybe it's just not the prevention of mammary cancer that we need to worry about. Maybe we need to think about other problems that can happen in these pets too. Also, we're, there's some evidence to suggest that, that dogs are less likely to have joint disease, hip dysplasia and knee disease, cruciate ruptures, um, if we allow their skeleton to grow slower and the muscle to grow with the bone um, more. So the more hormones they have, the more developed those muscles are gonna become. And so um, there are, there's lots of, of benefits to these hormones too. Um, so things may change, especially if you guys go to veterinary school, by the time you get out, the information, the recommendations may be completely different because we're learning more about what these hormones do for us. The other thing we think about with castration um, for male dogs is, is dogs, male dogs can develop perianal adenomas, so they're benign tumors that happen around the rectum that are associated with testosterone. And so if we castrate them, they're not gonna have any testosterone, so the risk of developing perianal adenomas is virtually zero in male dogs, castrated male dogs. Um, the other thing is, is if they do, if an intact male dog does develop a perianal adenoma, we can go in and we can castrate them and usually those tumors will reduce. They may not go away completely, but they may become non-problematic um, for the patient um, just by removing the source of hormones. So then the other question is, how do we diagnose cancer? And we do lots of different things. We aspirate a lot of masses. I said I don't touch scalpel blades very often, but I touch a lot of needles. Because what we will do is we will actually, this is a picture of a dog with lymphoma. And I use this picture because you can see her giant lymph nodes underneath her jaw there. And we will actually go in with this needle, just like you, we give a vaccine with. Um, so a very small needle and insert it into a lymph node, and those cells will come into our needle, so we can then spray them out on a slide. We spread out the slide, and then we'll stain the slide and look at those cells underneath the microscope. And we can get an idea of what's going on in that lymph node just by looking at, at the cytology from that lymph node aspirate. This is actually a picture of lymphoma um, from a dog. We also will do biopsies. We can do lots of different kinds of biopsies. We can do very non-invasive kind of percutaneous biopsies. So we'll take a small little sliver. This is only about an 18 gauge needle size. So it's maybe a couple of millimeters wide and maybe a centimeter to two centimeters in length. So this is not a very big biopsy sample at all. Pathologists hate 
true cut biopsy needles because we give them such a small little sample, we don't give them the whole tissue. Pathologists always want the whole tumor to look at and not just a little piece of it. We can take a punch biopsy where we just have a sharp, it's a round um, scalpel blade actually, and we can just go in, it's about the size of a pencil eraser, and we can just go and, and we can just cut a piece of tissue out with that little round biopsy punch. Or we can go to surgery and we can take a bigger piece. This is actually an excisional biopsy where we've gone in and we've excised a skin tumor. Um, and histopathology is when we take a biopsy, we submit it for histopathology so we can get a diagnosis. This is the gold standard for diagnosing a type of tumor doing histopathology. We're actually looking at the tissue versus just the cells with cytology um, for diagnosing a cancer or an abnormality. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cancer. And then we also do a lot of imaging. We do a lot of x-rays. X-rays are a one-dimensional view. This is a picture, a one-dimensional view of a thorax in a dog. We will oftentimes take three views if we're looking for tumor spread to the lungs. We'll take one of him laying on his right side, and we'll take one of him laying on his left side, and we'll take one of him laying on his back. So we can look at potentially all quadrants of the lungs and get as much of the lungs in there as we can. We'll do ultrasounds. This is a picture of an ultrasound, and this happens to be the spleen between that bright white line and this bright white line up here. And if you can imagine those little black spots in there, can you see those really dark black spots in there? It kind of looks like Swiss cheese if you use your imagination. This is actually a picture. This is what a spleen looks like that's infiltrated with lymphoma. This is a dog that had lymphoma in his spleen. The spleen should normally be all the same echo texture and not have those black spots throughout. It's a sign of infiltrative disease. It doesn't tell us that it's lymphoma, but we knew that this dog had lymphoma, so that's a classic um, look of lymphoma in the spleen. We can then go in and aspirate that spleen to see what kind of cells are in there and do just what we did on that lymph node I showed you the picture of. We can do that of the spleen and look at those cells underneath a microscope and confirm, yes, these cells look like they're the same cells that were in the lymph node, so this dog has lymphoma in his spleen. And then this is a picture of a CT scan where we get more of a three-dimensional view, not just a one-dimensional view, but where we can actually see um, inside the skull of this animal. This is a dog that had an oral tumor, as I mentioned. He had a, a carcinoma in his mouth. And you can see that it has gone up underneath his eye, just like we saw the picture of the dog. Actually, this may be the same as the dog that had the epistaxis. Um, we can see that that tumor is going up underneath his eye and it was starting inside his nose and inside his mouth. So it was involving all three of these cavities right here. And it's, you can see, if you look closely, these are his eyes. We're kind of looking down into his snout and we've taken a cross-sectional view there. You can see that it's kind of pushing his eye out of the socket a little bit. We call that exophthalmus. So his, his globe is outside of the socket. And if we were to, on a physical exam, we might be able to find this. If we were able to gently lay our eyes on, our thumbs on top of that animal's eyes, we'll do what we call retropulsion. And so we can actually see if both eyes retropulse the same amount because they should be symmetrical. They should go in the same amount on both sides. But in this dog, I would venture to guess that we wouldn't be able to retropulse that left eye because there's a mass behind it preventing us from being able to push it in a little bit. The one thing I will say is we oftentimes, we very often will use ultrasounds when we're trying to, to look to see where cancers might be inside the abdomen specifically, rather than doing a CAT scan. CAT scan, quite honestly, will give us more information, but our pets have to be anesthetized for us to do the CAT scan because they can't move while they're doing that, or we'll just get a big blur. We won't have very much information. We'll spend $800 and we'll just have a big blurry picture that doesn't really help us. So many times we'll do the ultrasound because they can move during the ultrasound because we have that ultrasound probe that we're moving back and forth and so they don't have to be asleep with the ultrasound. Sometimes we have to sedate them because they're just too antsy, they don't want to stay on the table, but they don't have to be anesthetized for the ultrasound. So cost difference between an ultrasound and a CT scan, the ultrasound costs us about $200 versus a CT scan which costs us about $800. So there's a big difference potentially.
I made this slide just to have a list of kinds of tumors that we see, examples of tumors. I'll mention this picture here. This is a picture of a dog that presented to us. You can see the swelling in his left front leg. This actually is a primary bone tumor called an osteosarcoma. And this is what this dog's leg looked like when we took an x-ray of it, when we did the radiograph. And you can tell, here's the normal bone here. This is the radius, which is the big bone in our arm, in our, our front leg. Um, and you can see how there's that patchy lysis inside the middle of that. And we can see some increase in soft tissue on the outside. And we can see some, some um, new bone deposition on the outside of that bone, where actually the tumor's laying down some new bone. Um, it's not normal bone, but it's bone that's being laid down by the tumor cells. Tumors in cats. Um, I have mentioned lymphoma and squamous cell carcinoma. I've mentioned the injection site sarcomas as well as the mammary tumors. This is a picture of a cat. His name was Sir Charles. I, always, I think of this cat as a girl cat, but it was a boy cat, a handsome boy cat named Sir Charles. And Sir Charles presented to his veterinarian because he wasn't eating very well. And when looked underneath his tongue, actually he had a squamous cell carcinoma growing underneath his tongue. So. More squamous cell carcinomas are found actually on dental because either cats aren't eating very well and so when their teeth hurt, they don't eat very well or they have stinky breath like I mentioned. And so we go in and do a dental and that's when we actually see the mass under the tongue because it's really hard to get cats to let you look underneath their tongues. They don't stick their tongue out and say, ah, oh, like our doctors tell us to do. And so the other thing I mentioned that um, our animals live in the similar environment that we do, and so cancers develop spontaneously. They're not something that are created in the laboratory. They're spontaneously developing tumors. Animals are subjected to the same carcinogens we are. And so we think about translational research, as I mentioned, and these are tumors that are very often used as translational research model in people. This is actually a dog who had cutaneous lymphoma, and he was on a clinical trial when I was a resident. Um, and I will forever remember Dutch. A, he's a really cute bulldog, but he was also a patient that I was seeing on um, September 11th. So I remember his owner sitting in our lobby as the World Trade Center was coming down. So he had a big impact on my life. He was a really neat dog, though, too. And he lived for a long time with his cutaneous lymphoma. You can actually see his spots on his arm that's actually lymphoma there on his arm. So his lymphoma was in his skin and not in his lymph nodes per se. So this is a chart that just has a comparison of the incidence rates of cancers, some cancers in dogs and cats and people. And you will see that mammary cancer happens more in dogs than in people. We can see melanomas, as I mentioned. Um, so cancers happen fa fairly frequently in dogs and cats, and, and so there's a lot of patients out there that, that may benefit from, from us trying to study these cancers, not just in dogs and cats, but also in people. So then the question is, how do we treat cancer? We can treat it a lot of different ways, um, but these are the big four, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and immune stimulation. I mentioned the melanoma vaccine, and, and that's what we're trying to do with that. It's not a vaccine to prevent the tumor development. It's actually a vaccine to stimulate the immune system to pick up the tumor cells that are in the system. Um, so those cells aren't able to survive. The immune system will kill those cells, basically. But we have to sensitize the immune system to those cells to tell them, hey, these are the bad guys. These are the cells that we don't want to survive. So here's a picture of a dog who had a, a rib, had a chondrosarcoma, and you can see um, the swelling on his chest wall there. And here's his x-ray. You have to use your imagination, but if you look at this rib over here, you can see the rib that goes all the way out to his side. But when you look on this picture, we lose the rib right about here. So that chondrosarcoma was actually eating his rib. It, a chondrosarcoma is a tumor of cartilage, and part of the ribs are cartilage, and so the tumor had developed in the cartilage of the rib. So the next picture, if you guys are squeamish, the next pictures are a little bit um, bloody, so you might want to look away. Um, but 
Here's a picture. The surgeon that did this surgery was very aggressive, and he went in, and what we generally think of, we need to take um, one rib on either side of the mass. So this mass, when he got it out, it looks like it was affecting two ribs. So we need to take at least four ribs out because we want to take the rib in front of and the rib behind, um, and plus the two ribs. So we took out four ribs. Actually, he, had, he took out five ribs in this guy um, because he wasn't sure if this rib over here was involved. And so he went in. Here he is before he resected the mass. And he cut this mass. He cut, made this incision so he had the skin to close back together. So that's why it's not just a straight incision. And then when he had that defect of four to five ribs that he'd taken out, he had to put something in because there wasn't any rib left. And so he actually put in a mesh there, a little metal mesh there um, to help protect that dog's thoracic cavity kind of form a false rib cage, if you will. And then he, here he is once he was able to sew up that. You would never know that that dog had four or five ribs taken out, would you? This dog did very well, lived for a couple of years postoperatively with surgery alone. We give chemotherapy to dogs, primarily lymphoma. Um, if we're treating as a primary treatment, lymphoma is a disease that tends to be systemic. It doesn't tend to be just a focal disease most lymphomas, and so we usually treat it with chemotherapy because we can't cut it out if it's multiple places. We also will use chemotherapy to try and control metastasis. So if we have a tumor that we know is likely to spread, we'll recommend chemotherapy to try and prevent that spread. And osteosarcoma is one of the prime examples of that disease, or of that situation. Again, osteosarcoma is the, the primary tumor of bone. I showed you the dog that had the lytic radius, the big swelling on his, his limb. So these are pictures of, of dogs getting chemotherapy. This is a dog that had lymphoma that we were treating. Um, and this is a little dog actually that had mast cell, a mast cell tumor, a skin tumor um, that we were treating with chemotherapy. You might say, well, chemotherapy, isn't that going to make them really sick? And I, yes, chemotherapy has the potential to have side effects. But we have tried to determine doses for our pets where they are less likely to develop side effects. We also have medications that we can use to try and prevent those side effects from happening. And we're pretty conscientious about evaluating them, evaluating their blood counts, because we worry about lowering of the white blood cells, which causes suppression of the immune system. So we watch their blood counts pretty carefully so we can put them on antibiotics to prevent an infection should their white blood cell count get low enough. Um, again, we have lots of medications that we can use should they develop a, stom a stomach side effect or diarrhea. But I will tell you, it really only happens in about 20% of our patients that we need to have some sort of medical therapy to help with the side effects, because most of the time they're mild and self-limiting if they happen at all. So um, uncommon, one thing that's really common in people is hair loss, but it is very uncommon in our population of animals, except our little white fluffy dogs, which is unfortunate because those are the dogs that oftentimes go to the groomers and that the owners are really worried about their coat. Um, but we can also see whisker loss. This is a picture of Samba. I showed you Samba a little a while ago. He was the Feluc positive cat that had lymphoma that we treated. He lost all of his whiskers with Docs Ruberson. He actually has one whisker that's standing up here, but it doesn't show up on the, this projection. And then this little guy's name, his name was Lucas, and he was a Bichon that unfortunately he was a little white dog. He did lose his hair. Um, but his owner had a great sense of humor. He lived for five years. Um, after he was diagnosed with lymphoma, so he lived to be an old man. He was 10 when he was diagnosed, so he lived till he was 15. And actually, he didn't die because of lymphoma. He died because of another problem. He actually died because of kidney failure. Um, but Lucas did lose his hair during chemotherapy, but his owner would put clothes on him, and he came to the hospital every single time he had a different outfit on. <laughs> he had a bigger wardrobe than I did. And you can see his owner is quite happy with how he's doing. And she also had a really good sense of humor about it. Not only did she dress him, but one day we had an old English sheepdog that was in that was going to have surgery, so we'd clipped off his hair. We made him a little toupee um, to go along with his, <laughs> his clothes. So he doesn't have his toupee on here, but um, our owners most of the time deal with it. If they know that it's going to happen, their hair will grow back once we stop the chemotherapy. And if they know that it's going to happen, it's usually short term, they can deal with it during that short term. It's when they're not expecting it that it usually catches them off guard. So. And then we also use radiation therapy. 
um, to treat many cancers. Usually they're local focal cancers that we use radiation to treat. This is the picture of a linear accelerator. This is the linear accelerator we have at K-State. So we do radiation therapy for our pets. This is actually this linear accelerator. It's a second-hand machine. It was taken out of a human hospital and put into our, our hospital. So most of the machines, some places buy brand new machines. A brand new linear accelerator costs on the order of three to five million dollars. So they're not cheap machines by any means. Um, so that's why the, the treatment gets to be pretty expensive. But when I think about the cost of it, I will tell you for us to do full course radiation therapy for a patient, such as this kitty cat right here, um, it costs between um, four and five thousand dollars. That is the whole treatment with the CT scan to localize the tumor, the radiation planning. We actually have a computer system, computer software that does the planning because we have to avoid the normal tissues. So we have to dose the radiation therapy to avoid the normal tissues around the tumor. Um, and that includes the anesthesia for every single treatment. They usually get 18 to 20 treatments. It includes the hospital time and it includes the treatment itself. So there's a lot that goes into that four to $5,000, but it's not a cheap therapy by any means. So we don't treat a ton of patients with radiation therapy, and not every patient is a candidate for radiation therapy either. So usually we use it for tumors that have been incompletely removed, um, and we use it to try and prevent recurrence. And so basically we use it to try and sterilize that tumor bed, so if there are any residual tumor cells behind, we kill them with the radiation therapy. We also can use it for dogs that have like an osteosarcoma, a bone tumor that are painful. We can use it to try and make them more comfortable. And some cases, like this cat, will use it as the primary therapy. This cat used to be all black, um, but she had nasal lymphoma. Nasal lymphoma in cats is usually confined to the nasal cavity. And so I know I said lymphoma usually is a systemic disease, but in the nose in cats, it tends to be right here, and that's the only place it is. And so we can treat them with radiation therapy, and they can do very well. This cat lived, I think she lived four years after radiation therapy. The one problem is she has, we like to call this her badge of courage, um, because oftentimes when pets lose their hair from radiation therapy, just in the radiation site, um, it grows back the opposite color. So black hair grows back gray because we have affected those hair follicles and the melanin in those hair follicles. But if we have a white dog, it'll oftentimes come back in black. It'll come back in darker. So go figure, right? So that's kind of the basics that I had. I had some cases that I had just in case there was more time. But I'll stop at this point and see. I know we're right at 4.30. I'll see if you guys have any questions, anything that I can answer. I know you have places to go. And the Royals are on. Do you find that a lot of pet owners carry pet insurance? And does that often cover cancer treatment? So it's a good question. The question is, do pet owners carry, do many of them carry insurance, and does it cover the cancer treatment? More and more, we're signing off on insurance papers. But not all that frequently does it happen. Maybe 1 in 10, 1 in 20 patients has insurance. And it depends on the insurance. I have treated some patients where um, the, the owner um, did pay for the extra cancer coverage, but it would only cover $300 a visit. And of course he had a 100 pound Rottweiler. <laughs> so the bigger the dog is, the more drug they get, the more expensive it is. So I always caution people if they ask my advice on getting insurance, make sure you read the small print about what it covers because sometimes even though it says it covers cancer, it may not cover everything. But I also had a patient recently that the owner literally bought insurance that covered cancer care three months before his dog was developed with a tumor. And this dog had lots of surgeries, he had lots of chemotherapy, he had um, radiation therapy, and his insurance covered everything. So some of it is very, very good. Yes? Do you treat any other animal besides dogs? That's a good question. Do we treat any other animals besides dogs and cats? And the answer is yes, sometimes. Um, we have an exotic medicine or um, the pocket pet um, 
we have a service that, that usually treats those animals. So I don't see many ferrets or mice or birds with cancer, but sometimes we do. Actually, the other oncologist that I work with went out to the zoo today because they had a, um, one of their big cats actually had a mass inside his chest, a mediastinal mass. Um, so they went out to try and get some samples of that. So sometimes we've treated an alpaca with radiation therapy, treated some horses, some cows. That sounds really easy, trying to get radiation therapy with an alpaca. It, it was, and, and it can be challenging because we had to anesthetize it to free each radiation. We changed our protocol a little bit, so we didn't do as many treatments. We only did 11 treatments on him, and we did them every other day because alpacas have a rumen. They have a four-quadrant stomach like like cattle do, and so we have to be really careful about taking them off food. And um, there are bigger anesthetic risks, so we had to change things around a little bit with our protocol so we'd make it safe for him. But I must say that alpaca, um, we treated him in 2009, and as far as I know, he is still doing well without recurrence of his tumor. And he'd had three surgeries before we did the radiation therapy. So his tumor kept recurring over and over and over again. So I think we helped him. Yeah. So any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for your attention. And if you guys need anything, Martha's got my email address, so don't hesitate to send me an email. And uh, go Royals, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.